Hi everyone, I hope this finds you doing well. I would like to invite you to visit the webpage at MindsetMattersPodcast1.com. There you'll find a blog um, that has pictures that go with the episode stories and there are ways to interact as well by leaving uh, messages or voicemails. Um, So we would love to hear from you. Also, if you need to reach out just to um, have a, a friend and some support, you can email me at Mindset Matters Podcast one dot um, at sorry gmail dot com. Uh, before we get into today's episode and explore the life of Frederick Douglass, I want to just give a very brief history of slavery. Um, there are some that um, believe that it was a uniquely um, American issue. And um, it actually is a very long and complex worldwide issue that continues today. So I think it's uh, really important to have an accurate and historical background for the topic uh, before we get into talking about Frederick Douglass and his enslavement and um, his uh, courage in speaking out against it. The history of slavery is a complex and pervasive one that spans across various civilizations, regions, and time periods. Slavery has taken different forms and manifested in diverse social, economic, and legal structures throughout history. Um, So here's a, a brief but broad overview. In the ancient civilizations, slavery existed in places such as Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and Rome. In these societies, slaves were often captured in wars or born into slavery, and they were used for agricultural labor, domestic work, and uh, were even indentured soldiers. Uh, During the trans-Saharan and transatlantic slave trades, uh, this was in the medieval period, the trans-Saharan slave trade saw the transportation of slaves across the Sahara Desert, primarily in North Africa, alongside Africans, Turks, Iranians, and Europeans, and Berbers were among the people traded by the Arabs, with the trade being practiced throughout the Arab world. In medieval Europe, the feudal system included a form of serfdom, where peasants were bound to the land. While not identical to slavery, serfs were not entirely free and were subject to the authority of landowners. Um, Asian and Middle Eastern slavery uh, existed in various forms in Asia and the Middle East. In some cases, prisoners of war became slaves, and there were systems of bonded labor. The Arab slave trade was significant in the Indian Ocean region as well. In the Americas, uh, colonial and plantation slavery led to the establishment of large-scale plantation economies that relied heavily on enslaved labor. European powers, especially the Spanish, Portuguese, British, Dutch, and French, were major participants in the transatlantic slave trade. In the 18th and 19th centuries, we saw the rise of the abolitionist movements in Europe and the Americas. The abolition of slavery became a central moral and political issue, leading to the gradual abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and eventually the emancipation of slaves in various countries. In 1948, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, including an article stating, No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Sadly, that being said, um, in this modern time of 2024, the world still struggles with the issue of slavery in its present-day forms of human trafficking, forced labor, forced marriages, debt bondage. Um, so we still are very much grappling as a, as a human race with this issue. Um, the history of slavery clearly is a testament to the complexity of human societies and the evolving nature of our social institutions and understanding the history is crucial for us to address the ongoing issues related to systemic inequality, injustice, 
Um, and as I said, the modern forms of slavery, including human trafficking. So as we learn about Frederick Douglass today in today's episode, um, let us think about and yearn for modern voices, including our own, with equal courage to his, who will speak up and speak out against human trafficking, forced labor, forced marriages, and debt bondage. Step into the extraordinary life of Frederick Douglass, a towering figure in American history, whose indomitable spirit shattered the chains of slavery and ignited a revolution for civil rights in America. Join us in this riveting episode as we unravel the untold stories, delve into the profound wisdom, and explore the enduring legacy of a man who went from a life in chains to becoming one of the most influential voices for freedom and equality. Welcome to Mindset Matters, the courage to continue, the podcast where we explore the extraordinary lives of ordinary individuals who have overcome immense challenges and emerged as beacons of inspiration. I'm your host, Lisa Sinclair, and today we're going to talk about one such person. This is episode 28, The Courage to Be a Social Reformer, the Hero Heart of Frederick Douglass. Frederick entered the world around 1818 in Talbot County, Maryland, where the precise details of his birth remain elusive to him. Born as Frederick Bailey to an enslaved black mother and a white father of European descent, he later adopted the name Douglas after successfully escaping from slavery. Originally known as Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey at birth, Douglas's journey from bondage to freedom reflects the complexities of his identity and the profound impact of his life on the fight for justice and equality in early America. Following his separation from his mother during infancy, Douglas spent a period of his early years under the care of his maternal grandmother, Betty Bailey. Nevertheless, by the age of six, he experienced a relocation from his grandmother's care to the Y House Plantation in Maryland, where he was tasked with both living and working. He found himself under the ownership of Lucretia Ald and Thomas Ald, her husband. They sent him to labor under his brother Hugh in Baltimore. Douglas acknowledges Sophia, Hugh's wife, for imparting his initial knowledge of the alphabet. Building upon this foundation, Douglas embarked on a self-driven journey to acquire literacy. By the period he was hired to work under William Freeland, Douglas had progressed to the point where he was instructing fellow enslaved individuals in reading, primarily utilizing the Bible as a teaching tool. As news circulated about his endeavors to educate fellow enslaved individuals, Thomas Ald reclaimed Douglas and assigned him to Edward Covey, a farmer notorious for his harsh treatment of those under his control. At approximately 16 years old during this period, Frederick endured frequent whippings under Covey's brutal supervision. Following multiple unsuccessful escape endeavors, Douglas ultimately departed Covey's farm in 1838, initiating his journey by boarding a train bound for Harve de Grace, Maryland. Progressing through Delaware, another state with slavery, he eventually reached New York, seeking refuge in the secure residence of abolitionist David Ruggles. Upon establishing himself in New York, Frederick summoned Anna Murray, a free black woman he had encountered in Baltimore during his captivity with the Alds. She joined him, and in September 1838, the two got married. Over the course of their union, they welcomed five children into their family. Following their wedding, the newlyweds relocated to New Bedford, Massachusetts, in this new community, they crossed paths with Nathan and Mary Johnson, a married couple born as free persons of color. The Johnsons served as the inspiration for the young couple to adopt the surname Douglas, drawing it from the character in Sir Walter Scott's poem, The Lady of the Lake. Upon settling in New Bedford, 
Douglas commenced his attendance at gatherings associated with the abolitionist movement. In these assemblies, he encountered the writings of the prominent abolitionist and journalist William Lloyd Garrison. Their paths converged when both were invited to address an abolitionist meeting, during which Douglas recounted his narrative of slavery and his escape. Garrison, impressed by Frederick Douglass's eloquence and conviction, urged him to embrace a role as a speaker and leader within the abolitionist movement. In 1843, Frederick joined the American Anti-Slavery Society's 100 Conventions Initiative, a comprehensive six-month tour spanning the United States. Throughout the tour, Douglas faced physical assaults from opponents of the abolitionist cause. During a particularly brutal incident in Pendleton, Indiana, Frederick suffered a broken hand. Unfortunately, the injuries never fully healed, and he never regained complete use of his hand as a result of the attack. In 1858, the fervent abolitionist John Brown took refuge with Frederick Douglass in Rochester, New York, while strategizing his daring raid on the U.S. military arsenal at Harper's Ferry. This audacious plan aimed to establish a refuge for formerly enslaved people in the mountains of Maryland and Virginia. Unfortunately, Brown's scheme was foiled, leading to his capture and subsequent execution by hanging. In his final statement, Brown ominously declared, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. Two years later, Frederick Douglass released his inaugural and most renowned autobiographical work, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. He further penned My Bondage and My Freedom and Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. Within his book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, he expressed, quote, From my earliest recollection, I date the entertainment of a deep conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul embrace, and in the darkest hours of my career in slavery, this living word of faith and spirit of hope departed not from me, but remained like ministering angels to cheer me through the gloom. End quote. In this same year, Douglas embarked on a journey to Ireland and Great Britain. During this period, Ireland was grappling with the onset of the Irish potato famine, also known as the Great Hunger. During his time abroad, Douglas was struck by the comparatively greater freedom he enjoyed as a man of color, contrasting with the constraints he had faced in the United States. While in Ireland, he had the opportunity to meet the Irish nationalist Daniel O'Connell, whose influence would later serve as an inspiration for Douglas's subsequent endeavors. While in England, Douglas delivered a speech that would later be recognized as one of his most renowned, commonly referred to as the London Reception Speech. Upon his return to the United States in 1847, Frederick Douglass initiated the publication of his own abolitionist newsletter called The North Star. In addition to being an active abolitionist, Frederick Douglass actively engaged in the women's rights movement. Remarkably, he stood as the only African-American participant at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, a significant gathering of women's rights activists in New York. Expressing his views with conviction during the meeting, Douglass asserted, quote, in this denial of the right to participate in government, not merely the degradation of women and the perpetuation of a great injustice happens, but the maiming and repudiation of one half of the moral and intellectual power of the government of the world. End quote. Subsequently, Douglas expanded coverage of women's rights issues within the pages of his North Star. The newsletter underwent a change to Frederick Douglass paper in 1851, remaining in publication until 1860, shortly before the commencement of the Civil War. Throughout the tumultuous conflict that fractured the young United States, 
Douglas persistently addressed the public and exerted unrelenting efforts toward the abolition of slavery and the securing of voting rights for newly emancipated black Americans. In the course of the Civil War, Frederick Douglass leveraged his position as the leading African-American social reformer, orator, writer, and abolitionist to encourage men of his race to enlist in the Union Army. Through his publication called Men of Color to Arms Now or Never, Frederick urged formerly enslaved men to, quote, rise up in the dignity of our manhood and show by our own right arms that we are worthy to be free men, end quote. Douglas perceived the Civil War as a pivotal opportunity for African American men. He viewed it as the golden moment for them to unite with men of all races, asserting their right to freedom and demonstrating their manly character. Douglas envisioned that by defending their country, black men could unequivocally claim America as his country and have that claim respected. Serving as uniformed soldiers would enable them to shed the image of powerless enslaved individuals and assert the rights of male citizenship associated with patriotic service. Since the onset of the Civil War in 1861, Douglas fervently implored Abraham Lincoln and others to afford black men the opportunity to join the fight. In his publication, Douglas's Monthly, he questioned, quote, Is he not a man? Can he not wield a sword, fire a gun, march and countermarch, and obey orders like others? End quote. On January 1, 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, liberating all enslaved individuals in the states that had seceded from the Union. Notably, the proclamation also contained a directive for the enlistment of African American men into the Union Armed Forces. With this newfound government authorization for recruitment, Frederick Douglass embarked on a journey spanning over 2,000 miles from Boston to Chicago. He passionately extolled the virtues of serving the Union cause to black men during his recruiting speeches, often concluding with the leading the audience in singing John Brown's Body, a popular song of the Union Army. In the early months of 1863, the Massachusetts legislature compensated Douglas with $10 per week for his efforts in recruiting African-American men for the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. This regiment stood as the inaugural black military unit raised by the North during the Civil War. Frederick Douglass leveraged his self-published newspaper, Douglass's Monthly, as a potent communication tool, employing it to both enlist black men and persuade skeptical white individuals regarding the capability and aptitude of black men for combat. Notably, Douglass widely distributed his Men of Color broadside, utilizing it as a visible presence across northern cities. According to David Blight, the author of the biography Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, Douglass, who frequently addressed his audiences as brothers and fathers, came to regard the war as a special affair of black fraternity and manhood. Douglass's own sons, Lewis and Charles, emerged as among the first volunteers for the 54th, a unit that eventually comprised over 1,000 men hailing from 15 northern states. On May 28, 1863, the regiment paraded through the streets of Boston before embarking on their journey to Beaufort, South Carolina. Douglas stood witness as he bid farewell to his sons and the many men he had recruited into the regiment. According to Blight, who wrote the biography Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, the spectacle was unforgettable. A thousand smartly stepping black men with Enfield rifles— leaning forward gracefully, moving as one body toward history, heroism, and death, to prove to their slaveholding country that they were indeed truly men. Thomas Long, a Civil War veteran who had once been enslaved, articulated a sentiment that encapsulated one of the most treasured outcomes for Douglas. Quote, if we hadn't become soldiers, all might have gone back as it was before. But now things can never go back, 
because we have shown our energy, our courage, and our natural manhood. End quote. After the Civil War and Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the passage of Amendments 13, 14, and 15 to the U.S. Constitution respectively abolished slavery, granted formerly enslaved individuals citizenship and equal protection under the law, and protected all citizens from racial discrimination in voting. Douglas received the honor of delivering a speech at the dedication of the Emancipation Memorial in Washington, D.C.'s Lincoln Park in 1876. Historical accounts indicate that after delivering the aforementioned speech, Mary Todd Lincoln, the widow of President Lincoln, is said to have gifted Douglas with Lincoln's favorite walking stick. During the post-war Reconstruction era, Douglas assumed various official roles in the government, including serving as an ambassador to the Dominican Republic, making him the first black man to hold such a high office. Simultaneously, he persisted in delivering speeches and advocating for the rights of African Americans and women. In a remarkable turn of events in 1877, Douglas crossed paths with Thomas Old, the very man who once claimed ownership over him and astonishingly, the two reportedly found a path to reconciliation. The twists in Douglas's personal life continued when his dear wife Anna passed away in 1882. Not one to be confined by societal norms, he entered into a marriage with Helen Pitts, a white activist, in 1884, challenging the conventions of his time. In a groundbreaking moment for history in 1888, Douglas secured a notable distinction by becoming the first African American to receive a vote for presidency at the Republican National Convention. Despite this milestone, Benjamin Harrison ultimately clinched the party nomination. The saga of Douglas's life unfolded with unexpected connections and pivotal moments in the tapestry of American history. Frederick Douglass, a dynamic force of activism, and eloquence, continued to captivate audiences with his speeches and writings until his passing in 1895. The final chapter of his life unfolded dramatically as he succumbed to a heart attack at home just after returning from a meeting with the fledgling National Council of Women, a pioneering women's rights group based in Washington, D.C. Frederick Douglass's Legacy endures as a beacon of inspiration for those championing equality and striving for a more just society. His indomitable spirit and tireless dedication to the pursuit of justice continue to reverberate, shaping the ongoing quest for a world that echoes the principles he so ardently championed. If you would like to read and learn more about Frederick Douglass, um, of course, I would recommend his own uh, autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. Um, it was republished back in December of 2019. Um, and I would also highly recommend the Pulitzer Prize winning book written by David Blight entitled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. And for kids uh, ages 8 to 12, we go back to that really good series, the Who Is series, and uh, recommend the book Who Is Frederick Douglass as a book for kids. Our quote of the day comes from Frederick Douglass, and it's uh, from his publication Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. He says, quote, no man can be truly free whose liberty is dependent upon the thought, feeling, and action of others, and who has himself no means in his own hands for guarding, protecting, defending, and maintaining that liberty. End quote. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Um, we would really like to have your hero heart stories from your corner of the world. If you would like to share that, something wonderful that's happening, um, somebody local or perhaps it's yourself that's being a beacon of inspiration in your corner of the world, please send it to Mindset Matters Podcast One, that's the number one, at gmail.com. 
I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue. And our next episode will be on Liz Murray. So we hope to see you then. Thank you for giving your time to listen to this episode of Mindset Matters, The Courage to Continue. You are of value. You are loved. You are not alone. If you are struggling with thoughts of suicide, help is available. Dial 988 24 hours a day for free confidential support. If you are not in crisis but need support, please feel free to reach out to me at the email Mindset Matters Podcast numeral one at gmail.com. Again, that's all lowercase Mindset Matters Podcast the numeral one at gmail.com. Remember to change your day by what you think and say. We'll see you next time.